Welcome to the Big Picture Show with your host, Josh Tickell. We are the new media, so don't forget to like and share this podcast. And welcome to the Big Picture Show with your host, Josh Tickell. We have a great show for you this week. Got some very authentic farm-to-table, farm-farm-farm food and food conversation coming your way. Before we do that, just a little news from Ojai, California. The seasons are changing. It's beautiful here in our little town nestled in the Los Padres National Forest foothills. They're still spraying that chemical that uh, Rebecca did her field report on in local parks to cut down on the invasive Arundo. So we are dealing with our own chemical issues here in our idyllic little town. I'm going to do some news for you today, and then we have an incredible field report that Rebecca Tickell put together from her home state of Vermont. And then I've got an incredible guest who I'm teasing. I'm teasing him out. He's such an amazing, incredible farmer and restaurateur. You'll meet him in a minute. Syria has joined the Paris Climate Accord. Yes, Syria, the war-torn country spewing refugees into Europe. This just on the heels of Nicaragua joining the Paris Accord. Now, what's amazing is the Washington Post says, you know, as Syria embraces the Paris climate deal, it's the United States against the world. Of course, that wouldn't be the first time for the U.S. And bear in mind, people, the Paris Accord is largely hyperbole. Much of what's in the accord is non-enforceable. Many of the countries who've signed onto the accord don't actually intend to follow through, and the accord does not take place, does not take place for another three consecutive years. So even if you've signed on with an intended, and again, these are intended emissions reduction, you're not going to begin that reduction for three years. So it is the U.S. against the world, but maybe it's even the world against the world. We need to look at these accords and what they really spell out. As I've committed to you in the past, this season is about the connections between climate food, and health. So, here we go. According to the Smithsonian, just a few species make up most of Earth's food supply, and that's a problem. The Smithsonian writes, the looming threat of extinction from climate change makes the lack of diversity in the world's food supplies a dangerous prospect. They say over-reliance on too few varieties, too few varieties, excuse me, and species is leaving the food system unnecessarily exposed to shocks and stresses, as well as neglecting a high-impact solution to major health, environmental, and food security challenges. For example, they talk about the reliance on potatoes in Ireland that led to the potato famine in 19th century Ireland. They are concerned that if we rely our food supply on only a few species, we could face similar issues. Crop blight, we know that happens with corn. We know that happens with rice sometimes. Dangerous. They advise that we diversify our food sources and grow a more diverse array of foods. Of course, that's what we were talking about in the Kiss the Ground book. Moving right along. Good news. The microbiome database now spans seven countries and 27,000 samples. The Earth Microbiome Project is in 43 countries. It involves 500 researchers, and they've identified 300,000 different microbiomes. What is a microbiome? It is a collection of organisms, a place for microbes to live. And why, is, why are microbes important? Because they make up our health, they make up the soil's health, and they really make up the basis of the food chain. So this project is the largest international project to advance the science and understanding of microbes, those wonderful little critters that keep us alive. New information from Ohio. Leaving prairie strips on farmland pays off. Even a relatively small amount of prairie on certain farmland can deliver major environmental benefits. 10 years of data, they've been doing this. It's called the STRIPS, the Science-Based Trials of Row Crops, integrated with prairie, prairie strips. Now, each prairie strip contained a diverse range of perennial grass and wildflower species. And what they're basically doing is 
they're planting these little pra prairie strips along the edges of a regular monocropped field. But the results are dramatic. A lot of environmental benefits. So the benefits. Covering as little as 10% of the area with a prairie strip reduced soil loss by 95%, reduced the loss of false phosphorus in surface runoff by 77%, nitrate concentrations in groundwater. Remember, the nitrates in our groundwater, one of the main sources of pollution in the U.S., and these are creating the dead zones in places like the Gulf of Mexico, reduced nitrate runoff by 72% and reduced nitrogen losses in the surface runoff by 70% compared with all crop watersheds. So plant a little bit of prairie around your crops and you get all these benefits. Pollinators and bird species doubled. And of course, that is the magic of an ecosystemic approach to farming. We're finding this in study after study, trial after trial. When you integrate multiple species, when you integrate multiple, multiple crops, you can grow more and healthier and better food. You can stabilize the soil. And we're gonna talk about that with our incredible guest in a minute. But before we do that, here is a field report from Rebecca Harold Tekel. She just re returned from a trip to Vermont where there is a strange invasive species spurred on by global warming that actually burns you. It's like night of the killer plants. Here we go with Rebecca's field report. I'm Rebecca Tekel reporting from the field. And isn't this a beautiful field? This is where I grew up, in Heinsburg, Vermont. As a young person, I played in these fields every day. But due to warmer winters and longer summers, an invasive species called wild parsnip, or poison parsnip, has taken over my home state. When I brought my daughter here last summer, she and I both got covered in it, which resulted in painful burns. This is what the locals have to say about the situation. My name is David Zuckerman. I have a couple different titles. One is organic vegetable, organic chicken, and mostly organic pork farm. And I'm also the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Vermont. There's no doubt that um, our agricultural zone is changing, that our winter lowest temperatures aren't as low, the cold snaps don't last as long, uh, which is really the foundation of what can survive or not survive through winter uh, and changes the zone that you're in. Uh, we're sitting here at the end of October on a 70 degree day, which is just not what I experienced when I came to Vermont in 1989. I don't remember summer extending as deeply into September and October as it has, maybe for a couple days, but not day after day that are 70 or 80 or in September we had multiple days over 90 degrees. 50 years ago, we would have had a frost six weeks earlier. Many of the invasive species moved up from the south and they can live in places that they didn't used to be able to live when our winters were 30 below. I see it everywhere. Everywhere you drive around here, it's all beside the road. I cut them and then I pull the plant out if I can. Its sap is phototoxic. So that means it gets on your skin and the sun is shining, it burns and you can get very severe burns. These terrible blisters show up uh, and it's really quite painful. It's like a first, second or third degree burn depending on how bad it is. And you basically have almost a brown scar all summer. I think that it goes away the next year, but um, it, it's a severe burn. Oh, I think there's no doubt that um, Vermont's ski season is gonna be affected by climate change and already has been. That whole both economic and cultural piece of Vermont uh, may be gone in 50 years, uh, and parts of it will be gone sooner. The Green Mountain State is getting warmer. It now resembles the same climate as Virginia in the 1960s. That means we can say goodbye to our favorite Vermont maple syrup. And that may not seem like a big deal to you, but unless we all work together to reverse global warming, it may just be a matter of time until a similar problem shows up in your backyard. Ooh. And, and there you go, straight from the field from Rebecca, the strange things that are happening on our planet, plants that leap photobiotoxins onto your skin that weren't there just a couple years ago due to the change in climate. Now, she talked about things changing in your backyard. If you do come to our idyllic small town of Ojai, California, you will likely need to eat. One of the places that's very popular to eat is a restaurant called Farmer and the Cook. It's a place where everything is organic and where the farmer is named Steve Sprinkle. He's the man who co-founded this and his wife is the cook. 
So today with me in the studio, I have Steve Sprinkle. Steve, hi. thanks for joining us. Sure, glad to be here. So listen, Farmer the Cook's very popular here in Ojai, and I think most people in cities across the country would love to have some kind of restaurant where they could go and get you literally, it's a literally a farm to table restaurant, isn't it? Yes. So you, you're a farmer. Yes, yes. And my wife designs the menu and helps me design the farm based on the things we're going to serve. And, and so what, what type of things do you farm? I grow all year round. I'm growing a salad bar and I'm growing a produce department and I'm growing a Mexican restaurant. So we have a lot of cilantro. We never run out of cilantro if we can. We grow a lot of chili peppers. We, we process and freeze the chili peppers. Uh, we grow a lot of tomatoes and process and freeze the tomatoes. We grow a lot of onions. We don't grow the corn. Uh, I grow a lot of hard squash, which we use in tamales. So there's a lot of things that we use in the restaurant that we grow. And then we grow the salad bar. So by growing a salad bar, we grow lots of lettuce. We figured out how to grow lettuce in the summer. People come and see my lettuce a week after it's been 110 degrees. They say, how can you do that? I said, it wasn't easy. We figured out varieties to grow and what, um, what the requirements are. That's 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 a, that's a rare, a rare combination that you're not only serving something, but it's such a coordinated effort between the farm and literally the cook. Yes, yeah. So I know exactly what they need and what we like to do. like. Uh, for instance, onions. Onions is uh, kind of a sneaker crop. People don't know that it's one of the top five vegetables used. If you think about it for a minute, onions can be used at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You're not you really thinking of cauliflower or cabbage for breakfast, but onions are in an omelet. True. You know, and True. so we use yeah. a lot of onions. Yeah. And onions are a staple of making soup as well as Mexican food. Excellent. Okay. So, I mean, this conversation is already making me hungry, which is which is great because Farming the Cook happens to be a mile from, from our studio. But uh, when you go back and you look at the evolution of how, because I want to talk about how things have changed, both with the organic standard and you're probably just like the rest of the farmers in the country, noticing climactic changes that you have to challenges that you mm -hmm. have to deal with as well. So I want to talk about all that before we go into all that and the restaurant business and how all of that's changed. Let's take a step back. Where are you from? How did you get into doing this? I grew up in Southern California, and uh, I'm I'm the black sheep of a four generation large construction company, and I decided I just didn't want to do it. And some, I, I couldn't be a, a more opposite and antithetical son to my father uh, ever because he was um, a captain of industry and was largely responsible. He had seven asphalt plants. Okay, so your dad's a, a sort of a tar yes. and a road man. He's a, he's, yes, and we moved, pushed dirt around. We uh, when I worked for the company when I was young, uh, people would come and give me um, plans to, to provide a bid on, and one of them was to destroy 80 acres of Valencia oranges in Redlands. And I, you know, I go back and forth, and I just really couldn't do that. And so I walked away from uh, that. Uh, that uh, that is a, was a false destiny. And in the meantime, in the 60s, because I'm a child of the 60s, I'd been going to visit my friends who were uh, gardening with Alan Chadwick at Santa Cruz. And so I'm one of those people. I I was a I was a early uh, devotee of uh, French intensive uh, market gardening like John Jevons, mm -hmm. um, Andre ben Boisson. Benjamin, yes, yep. exactly, Great. Yep. Uh, Jimmy Nelson, mm -hmm. people up in, in the Santa Cruz area who um, uh, were teachers based on the Chadwick principle. And mm -hmm. and Chal Alan was was a charismatic and and inspiring character to be around. I, so I've, I caught I've, the bug. I caught the bug early. And, and I've heard his farms, his gardens were were extensive and beautiful and incredibly lush. Yes, and and he was given he essentially seized portions of the Santa Cruz campus be, uh, uh, below Merrill College. There's a very steep garden. They're one of the first ones that he made. Um, it's almost so steep you can't even walk up, and that was one of the first ones. He just took something that nobody else wanted, wow, and then and created it. Now you look and see what the um, the uh, Center for Agroecology is at UC Santa Cruz, 
and it's um, it's it's really the best school for alternative sustainable. I'm sorry for using the word alternative organic farming. Yeah, in the country, and it's all due to that brilliant higher in 1965. Wow. And, and, and if we look back at the zeitgeist of that time, you know, mid-60s, um, you know, you've got these huge social revolutions convalescing. You know, you've got the civil rights movement, you've got the women's liberation movement, you've got, you know, Vietnam. All of these things are happening simultaneously. What most people don't realize is the seeds of the food revolution, which haven't, you know, it, they're only now starting to germinate, have their basis in that time, at least in the United States. Yeah, we, we had small gardens. Um, then, because we, were, we didn't want to be, but we ended up being a little bit more ambitious than probably we had imagined, we had surplus. Mm. And so then there was, then, then commerce was invented. And then there were already um, food co-ops around the country. Mm. And that was a natural place for us to start selling. And we had our own uh, um, roadside stands. And then in the late 70s, the farmer's market movement took off. And that gave us a great basis. Mm -hmm. And so postage far stamp farms, in other words, one or two acre farms, began to be viable. Because there was a place to finally sell those those yes. products. Yes. Yeah, and and we we grew up being sort of in in retail, in other words, being in direct marketing, mm -hmm. and so we learned an awful lot about that. Then yeah. people like Alice Waters and many other chefs later on um, inspired us, and I, you know, like the first time I ever grew uh, basil uh, was a French chef came up and gave me a bag of seeds in 1981, and wow. I said, "Basil, what is that?" And I, then I found out. That's amazing. And, and so we had a we had a we had relationships. We still have relationships, but those early relationships um, were were um, pretty meaningful, and mm -hmm. because of course we didn't really know what we were doing, right? And well, so we we learned an awful lot by the people who would buy the product. And there was some desire. I mean, obviously, after World War II, there was a big push toward industrializing the food system. Yeah. How did the early organic movement, how did it find its footing? Was it a reaction to that industrialization and TV dinners and, and things that were insta, 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 you know, the sort of leave it to beaver uh, world in which the woman is, is an accessory to the kitchen, was an, which is an accessory itself to this huge industrial system. Were you guys kind of, in a way, rebelling against that? Well, we we all dropped out. We wanted to keep our hands clean of the of the system. Our diet dropped out too, mm. and so we wanted to grow our own foods because it was a matter of trust. Mm -hmm. The rivers were on fire mm -hmm. from pollution, right? And we looked at the world essentially as just covered in plastic, nothing real. And so, a natural response was your own garden, then your own farm, feeding your neighbors and providing that. Mm -hmm. And so time has gone on since then, and we have seen massive sea changes in food, both good and bad. There is a ever-growing push to industrialize, to centralize, to kind of create profit at every stage of this mass production of food. And yet the organic movement is still growing as well. How do you reconcile these two directions in our food system? Knowing the average American diet, 63% of what the average person on the street is putting into their body comes from a box, a bag, a carton, or a tube from some processed garbage. Well, <clears throat> I'm beginning to be a little bit more reluctant about defending um, how, uh, many, how many of us embraced the advent of large-scale organic farming. Mm. When um, the Pavitches came along with their large grape um, entry and uh, Cal Organic came along with their large vegetable entry in the 80s, we embrace this, and a lot of us, and I still do think that um, you're not going to get environmental change and remedy unless broadacre farming converts. Big, big farming. Big We're talking big about farming. 915 million production acres of 
land in the U.S. That's yes. really, really, that's where the bulk of the grain is grown. We've got about a third of that is is heavy intensive growing regions for farming. About two thirds is grazing land. So you really think that we've got to change those big swaths, not just along the coast. I don't think that you get if if you really want if you really want um, exponential and of scale change. If you want to take category one chemicals mm. like imidacloprid mm. or some of these other herbicides that are being used, if you want to take them off the table, yeah. then you have to give people a reason to do it and you have to you have to invite them to participate in that marketplace. And then the big box uh, world has opened its arms and said, we will, the Costco's and the Walmarts and uh, Kroger and 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 uh, and Albertsons and all these really big store chains mm. have opened up to um, to sell a lot of organic and now they are the biggest vendors. Yeah, and so um, for a lot of the pioneers, th- we've been left in the dust, mm-hmm. and we've had to scramble. And I'm glad I never really got too big. The biggest farm I ever had was 43 acres, and now I have 12. And I, this is a manageable size. It's a lot of vegetables to sell. It's still one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars worth of vegetables a year, but I, I I'm able to move them all. My friends who have three hundred acres, I feel like they're a little bit caught, and I know that they are because they've been they've been at farmers markets, they've been doing processing, they've been growing flowers, they've also been shipping. Mm-hmm. Now the shipping market is starting to evaporate mm-hmm. because of the advent of the large farms. Mm-hmm. When I was talking to a friend of mine, David Weinstein in Los Angeles, about this, I said, Dave, I'm, I'm starting to see fewer labels. In other words, I receive produce at my store, and I see all the boxes, and I'm seeing fewer labels. And he said, it's not because you're, there are fewer organic farms. A lot of the organic farms of that scale that were 60 or 150-acre farms that are kind of small farms, they're growing now in association. So they're banding together kind of in a syndicate. Yeah, uh, for good. Yeah, but a syndicate that will put one logo on maybe sixteen different farms' produce. Right, and okay. they're marching up from the Mexican border, or even starting in Mexico, mm-hmm. and they're coming up during the season. They're growing broccoli and Coachella in the dead of winter when we really can't produce it, right. and they're just going from there to Watsonville through Bakersfield and so on. Mm-hmm. And so these things um, are, um, are are consequence. Mm. And and uh, it's, it's their reaction to it. In other words, I don't really know how you get um, volume of scale uh, uh, semi-truck 22 pallet trailer loads of stuff into cities without this kind of technology and this kind of organizational um, system. Um, and it's not to be it's not to be it's not my place to criticize it because this is feeding a lot of people. And uh, the the question about about the um, the um, the justice angle of of who's get, who's eating this expensive organic food. Well, and this is this is the conundrum. We, you know, one of many conundrums because once you open the food box, it literally is Pandora's box. Right. We want to feed more people, but we want to feed people organic food. But there's obviously a price difference. We want to support small independent farmers. But now they have to band together to get food into markets, specifically in the cities. You know, it's 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 not a black and white system. It's not a black and white environment that we're we're dealing in. Um, how do you reconcile that price difference for people when when people say, "Well, organics for rich people. It's for you know upper class people who can afford it." What what are the people in the in the middle of inner city? You know. What are people in Compton eating? What are people in Watts eating? You know, what are people in in Oakland? Really, what's their access? If you really want to eat cheap, go to a Mexican American grocery store, a big one like Tres Sierras. An, an astounding price difference. Yes, for the same kind of quality, mm. and actually on the little fifteen foot wide organic. Um, section they have there, an astounding difference in prices that you might see at another store that might be more tony, have have more upscale. It could be, a lot, there's a lot of different stores that kind of fit that model now. They're, they have a lot of really good wine in them. They sell a lot of flowers. Mm. Um, there's a really significant uh, play in Delhi, 
in a lot of these these uh, tonier stores. But that's not not like that's not for a lot of these Mexican American stores. So these these places are really delivering um, not only cheap or let's let's say affordable. Mm. Affordable, right? Fresh produce. So, so you can, but actually, as well as organic produce as well. So you can actually go to some of these not name brand big box stores that we're all familiar with, but some of the more neighborhood, yeah, oriented stores in more ethnic neighborhoods, and there are actually organic products for sale in them. And I think also that these big box stores, uh, because of the the volume of sale of these bigger farms that have come in, mm. now I think that um, the in order to get volume of sale that the price has to meet a price point that people are going to find affordable. Right. Hence, and, they're hence, and that's what... Hence Costco, right? Right. And so when I look at the offer sheets from Los Angeles or San Francisco, and I then I can interpret what the sale price was on the farm, mm. I don't want that. I couldn't touch that. That mm. means they're getting uh, $14 or $12 for a 24-count box of kale or chard. So it's bulk Much pricing. less, much less. Yeah. So in other words, that by the time that box leaves the farm and it's on a refrigerator truck, mm. it goes to a distribution warehouse, mm. it's parceled out, and then put on a, you know, everywhere along the line, there's a truck driver or a telephone salesperson or a, a refrigeration um, tech who's handling all this. It's just not, you know, from my farm to my store, I cut out an awful lot of, of um processes by doing that. Well, you cut out you cut out all the middlemen essentially. You yes. you are a vertically integrated enterprise. Right. Literally, literally from the ground up. Right. Um which is which is in some ways ideal for a small scale farming operation. Now, let's take a step back because we've talked a little bit about the business of food and and how people are getting the food and all the steps that it's going through. But even before we get there, and, and how the, the price difference that exists for, for different neighborhoods and, and how you can potentially, if you're careful, find organic food even in uh, a lower price bracket. But for folks who are just getting into this, what is organic and is it really better? Why should people look for organic so the prices are beginning to be a little bit more affordable, but why should they go out of their way? Why should they drive an extra 10 or 15 minutes? Why should they go to the farmer's market? Why should they go, why should they go to a place like the farmer and the cook? What's the motive for that? Aside from the great company, of course, at the farmer's Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, the, and, and, and all the company we keep. Right. All the, it is a colorful. It's very colorful. It's a colorful yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. Colorful, colorful town, of yeah, course. We, yeah. yeah, we have unprepossessing movie stars there. And some some real down to home locals. Yes, yeah. yeah, good range. Let's see. So, I think that the reason why a, a an interested and a and a and a and a concerned new consumer of organic produce would want to do this is because they want to be able to trust what they're eating, what they're serving to their loved ones. Mm -hmm. I think that. Um, it can still be demonstrated that the certification, especially for fresh-grown organic produce in California, is pretty much airtight. Mm -hmm. I and think that the certification for organic produce is a believable system. So when you say the certification for organic produce, yes, many people are not familiar with what is behind that label. So, right. so what is that certification? What does it mean that you do critically? I mean, you, there's probably a long list. But what are the critical things that you do do, and what are the critical things that you don't do? Right. That make what, a what difference. The definition to, of yeah. Yes. That make a difference to me. You know, Joe consumer or or you know Jane consumer over here who's deciding between essentially two plates of food. Right. Well, we're all obligated to, and if anyone is, is who's uh, participating in commerce above five thousand dollars, which is really a pretty small sum, has to be certified. Mm -hmm. And so the certification essentially creates a challenge um, to not use synthetic chemicals, to not use uh, synthetic chemical fertilizers, herbicides, um, pesticides, um, fungicides. There's a large group of different kinds of farm inputs that farms use in order to provide a product. 
And uh, herbicides is a real big ticket item mm -hmm. that they use a lot of herbicide in order to achieve that. Mm -hmm. They use a lot of disease preventatives and disease remedies. A lot of people don't understand that um, mildew uh, and uh, a lot of like funguses and things like that are a significant issue on farms. So you've got you've got funguses, you've got pests that you're dealing yeah. with, you've got all sorts of different blight, you've got you've got herbs, you know, invasive species, herbicides to deal with those. So you don't use any of that on your farm. Right. So that's 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 essentially the bar, the challenge. Got it. So, Got it. so no two four D, no glyphosate, no Roundup, right. no Alar, no Divinazide, none no. of that stuff on Steve's farm. Right. And and in so theory, then what are we using? None of it on other organic farms, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and this is all demonstrable because the certification uh, mandates that the farm should be inspected every year. And it's one thing for the farm to physically be inspected, but the books are also audited. So if you're buying on the side, if you're buying a couple of gallons of this or that or, you know, this toxic chemical, it's going to show up in the audit. Right. And mm -hmm. and actually, what really shows up in the audit was that you bought and resold produce uh -huh. under another label. I see. And that's really where it does. You didn't, you didn't even bother to go out and buy a chemical. Right. So, you, were, you were committing fraud by misrepresenting your... And that's how, as an, as an inspector, that's how I've caught people, and that's how the biggest frauds have been uncovered. It's not, it's not farmers who are using something they shouldn't use. Mm. Um, we don't. We usually, we rarely see that someone's decertified for that purpose. It's just because they were uh, th that it was not believable that a quarter of a million dollars worth of broccoli came off of a of a five acre farm. I see. So it just it, the math just wasn't there. So, so people have there have been instances of farmers right. buying non-organic produce, right. stamping an organic label on it, shipping it off and selling it, and and probably making pretty good money that way. A double, double their money. Right. So and and, and they didn't have any risk, right. other than fraud. Other than fraud. And and the, and the minor fine. Right. But the an organic farm, on the other hand, uh, a farm like mine, then must demonstrate what they've done in order to not use those things or depend upon those things. And so uh, my farm uh, is a, is a, a di has, has evolved to be somewhat different. Mm. For example, I don't use compost anymore because I don't trust the compost stream. Got the it. compost stream is coming from industry. It's coming from uh, large-scale uh, recycling, mm -hmm. yard waste, mm -hmm. uh, golf course waste. It's coming from. It's uh, sorry to scare everyone. Uh, it's coming from. And look, this is what's happening. Yeah, so great. if you're, if it's you're coming getting... from, yeah, the the um, the and also the the the, the confined feedlot livestock industry. Right. So coming from CAFOs, which we know forty thousand cattle at when in one in one uh, in one lot. And so the, what are they doing? They're taking the manure. Yes. And cycling it into a compost right. situation, which is a good thing because it used to just sure. linger and then. Then create uh, water pollution. Look, it's it's better than leaving it in lagoons. Right. But do we want to eat compost made from manure that came from cows that have been also sprayed with pesticides that have been yeah. given tremendous veterinary amounts medicines, of antibiotics? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's something that really needs yeah. to be discovered. Right. As uh, what and and I think that we're we're really sort of whistling by the graveyard on the cleanliness of this product. Mm. And uh, I stopped using it in 2002 um, because of, I had a background as an activist in the GMO um, uh, campaign, and all of the feed going into these livestock facilities is GMO. Right. And most people don't realize the number one crop grown in America is field corn, often mis misnomered as feed corn, but it's field corn. And ninety nine something percent of that is be, you know is genetically engineered. Right. Of course, that goes and to the, the soybeans too. Yep. Soybeans and corn. It's, so soy is the second but biggest by crop. far the you know the, the many hundreds of a right. uh, millions of acres. Yeah. Right. So this you know it brings us to a um, an interesting question. Do you see do you see eating as a political act? Well, I always have because I've always been a political person. And I think you you make those kinds of choices 
um, in order to support what you think is right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm supporting, I used to be supporting my my cohort. I, I was essentially co supporting my my community. And I still hope that they can be called members of my community, even though they may be, you know, thousands of acres of organic farms. But I this was um, this drew us together, and then now um, to refuse to participate in the in the large scale produ production of conventional food. This is this sends a message, and and it's a message that's heard when you see the the, the billboard on the side of the road down in Ventura County that McDonald's has a kale salad. I think they're getting the picture. Right. McDonald's has smoothies, kale salads. And yeah. when when they finally, you know, they want they, to they, they want to buy it down on organic. Yeah. They yeah. you know they want to and they will when the economy of scale swings in to meet that demand because um they buy a lot of lettuce at McDonald's. Interesting. And imagine if they did how many acres of, of of land that had been previously abused with all these chemicals would come out. Mm -hmm. And so it's the land, it's the birds, it's the it's all the, the microbes now. The, the entire ecosystem the is the entire being ecosystem, yes. including all of the field workers, the mm -hmm. farm workers mm -hmm. and the managers as well, mm -hmm. and and who is living near these farms. Mm -hmm. Mm. And, and in the, Delano or in Coachella or in Calexico or in Oxnard, it's the people who work in those fields. Right. And so when you say it's political, I kind of think it's it's ecological racism. Okay, so because that gets, those people, yeah. those are the one, those are the people on the on the cutting edge. Those people, when you walk through and they're bent over, hucking those strawberries out of there. There's a there's a ground rig, two hundred yards away. He's spraying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 really kind of a danger zone out there. It's a yeah, it's a toxic war zone. We're yeah, using we're yeah. using you know World War II and Vietnam era technology to spray heavy pesticides, heavy herbicides onto our food. The most, as you said, the people who are in the 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 fallout area, as the yeah. EPA calls it, that literally falling on their skin, are mostly immigrants. They're mostly People of color, they're mostly people uh, who are originating from some other place other than Scandinavia. Yeah. Or, or you know, uh, Britain, you know, right. Germany. Um, yeah. So, it, you know, it's, it ain't the Hitler Juden out there picking the vegetables. No. And, and, and I think that's a huge issue. And, and you know, Dolores Huerta's film is right. now out. Yeah, I just saw it. It did come out. Yeah. Right. So we, we, we are starting to <laughs> retroactively try and, you know, write in a bit of the history that's been written out about our food system, which is, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, if you eat vegetables in the United States or fruit, there is a long chain of, of you know, injustice that's being done. Study after study after study on farm workers and farm fields, um, people living within a mile or two of farm fields, especially in California. This goes all up and down the California coast, in, in, even in places, wonderful places like Berkeley, where supposedly none of this you know, could affect any of that, that, that upper class population. Once again, multi-generational studies showing exposure to DDT, exposure to 2,4-D, any of these, they increase ADHD, uh, increase ADD. Uh, there are several studies. Asthma. Yeah. Asthma. There are several studies, uh, long-term, longitudinal studies, showing drops in child IQ based uh, corollarily to how much exposure mom received to field chemicals. Yeah. So this is this is a super serious issue. Super serious. Yeah, and so how can I stand as an organic farmer? How can I stand <clears throat> in the way of that if it's progress and and now for example William Boldhouse, which actually has been bought. William Boldhouse, mm -hmm. one time the world's largest carrot grower. Right. And I was their inspector on their first experiment in 1988. Wow. 200 acres of carrots. And um, 
then I visited them again in 2005. And now at any given time, they have between eight and 10,000 acres of organic carrots in production out of 70,000 total acres. And they obtain land if it's clean. They're looking for clean land. So the minute they, they put it together and, and make it in, in the shape that it can be to be farmed on, they're converting it to organic. And so I can't stand, I can't, I can't, I can't really say that's, that, that's something that we didn't envision. Actually, it, it would be great if we did envision it because a lot of the pioneers wanted to have more organic farm fields and not have a niche market for ourselves. I, I, I never thought it was, I, I think that would have been short-sighted. And so verticality for me has been the only the, the way to go. And you know, I'm not alone. There's an awful lot of little little farm to table stores and farms that are connected with restaurants, either like mine or some kind of other hybrid system um, that have been going on for a long time. It's a it's a it's a very attractive idea. Mm. Um, you know, Chez Panisse they have these these kinds of very strong relationships with people where where the the Alice and the people that she had out there working in the field were, were uh, um, uh, contributing to their product list, the mm. farm product list. Mm. So they had a lot of communication back and forth. Mm -hmm. So this, I'm not, I'm not alone in that. Right. And I've been trying to get people to, to imitate me. I, people say, Steve, you should franchise this. I said, no, I would be happy to just give it away for free. Right. If well, someone knows how to do that, if someone wanted to know how to do this, it's fine with me. Well, well, I, I wouldn't want, I don't, like franchising it would be just uh, another ball and chain. Right. Well, well, that's not your style. And, and look at our town. You know, we've got, I don't know, uh, I'm going to guess 15 restaurants just off the back of the, you know, how many of them, how many of them make even an effort to source locally? Not as many as, as they are claiming. Right. That's for sure. <laughs> less than a third. Let's just let's say, say less, than, less a than a third. And and, and yeah. uh, God bless those that right. do. It's, right. it's and this tough. is this is a community of people who largely have migrated from you know LA. Uh, overall, this is a more moneyed community than many communities yeah. in the world. And yet our food system is such an example of our politics of our mentality. Now let's let's blow this up and let's look at the larger country, okay? So food is political. That's one of your that's one of your sort of statements. If food is political, what are we saying about the food choices we are making as a culture? And and how do you break that? Because I think look, I'm all for it. Let's take the 915 million acres of production agriculture that we have in the US and let's get those off of the heavy chemicals. Let's get the cover crops happening. Let's at least begin to integrate these some of these organic practices on a big scale where they can make a big difference to the soil health and to our health. But don't we have a cultural issue? Don't we have to deal with what's not the not what's on our soil first, but don't we have to deal the with the the gray matter between our ears on a mass scale? And how do we do that? I think that if um the surveys are anywhere close to being true or correct that 60 to 70 percent of this sampled population wants to buy organic and they have reasons why they don't either price or the availability it's not in their neighborhood there's a lot of different reasons mm. if 60 percent of them want it and then the rest of these Providers, if they're a producer or a distributor or a manufacturer, are also providing it. Um, they are trying to meet that demand. When I was figuring out this kind of question, like say 10 years ago, I did the math and I figured that we got parity, which was 50%, somewhere between 2040 and 2050. 
but oh, I don't oh, really th- in terms of future like uh, yeah. that's when organic yeah organic would be fifty percent of 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 the volume of sale or mm-hmm. acreage. Man, that's a long time to that's wait. True, we yeah, have to I don't wait. think I don't think we have that we much have time. We have to wait till twenty forty to yeah. have decent food in this be, country. If you kept on multiplying, you had this yeah. percentage of increase. Right. The number that you're trying to reach yes. is so astronomically large. No, it's I mean it's it's huge. They How said that the Packer, which is the the journal of the produce industry, said mm. that uh, organic produce now is a thirteen billion dollar a year business. And that sounds like a lot of money until you compare it to the total two hundred to three hundred billion dollar fresh produce industry. So we're not even at five percent. No. Wow. If it's and somewhere between 5 and 10%. Now, we get an awful, an awful lot of play. We get right. an awful lot of uh, people who are interested yes. in what we're doing. Well, I think I eat 5% just based yes, on my trips pr- to your you. restaurant. Thank you. <laughs> you know, but, but seriously, if we're going to accelerate that curve, it's going to not be a linear change. If we really want to move that date up, let's say, so if we're, if we're going along a linear path, we're going to have a decent sum, not even all of our food, be grown without toxic chemicals by 2050. What if we, what if we, <laughs> I'd like to see it done, you know, within 10 years. What do we have to do to make this an exponential change? Well, maybe um, it's like Air Jordans. Is everybody, did you ever have a pair of Air Jordans? I personally never had I a pair. had, I went out and got myself a pair of Air Jordans okay. in the 80s. Yes. I wore those Air I did Jordans. have Converse. I mean, I had all the knockoffs, and, and, you know. And, 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 and uh, kids whose parents don't get Bon Appetit and Mother Jones in the mailbox um, every week, um, they followed their sports figures. And I understand now that a lot of sports teams are eating organically. Yeah, it would make sense, and, right? And I, I just read that, and I knew that they were dabbling in it, you know, mm-hmm. or, or certain like Kobe Bryant was doing it, or mm-hmm. or or um, Dwayne Wade was doing it, or something like that. But mm-hmm. I think if role models are seen um, making that change, then you're going to get an awful lot of interest from a lot of people who might not, who who, who to for whom it's a non-issue. You know, if they say, hey, I you think I'm doing a lot better now. I feel like I've got more stamina because of. Then maybe then that's the reason. I, that, I, I think stamina always sells. Stamina you sells. Stamina sells, Who doesn't right? Stamina? Yeah, stamina. And um, so I think that um, we've done what we can with the given clientele. Mm-hmm. And So you're saying we need a new crop of young people who are looking out for their role models, and the, you're saying, look, you know, role model X Y Z person. You're a sports figure. You're mm-hmm. a you're a, a major celebrity. Use your power to change the food system of this country. Right. I think that's a good challenge. And I think, and I think if they can do it, because they're already doing it, mm-hmm. and they're honestly. They have they have they have they have an honest message mm-hmm. that, that, that it's a legitimate deal and they're not just selling, uh, you know, milk right or something right. Know. Sorry, milk producers, but you know. Well, let's face it. Most milk comes from CAFO style yeah. operations, and right. that's toxic. We know yeah. that the toxins that get sprayed on the cows that get fed to the cows, where's it going to go? Just like it does with human mothers. We've seen this in study after study. It goes through the breast into the milk. And Mm -hmm. then uh, um, certain media are more apt to be um, useful for that purpose than... The New York Times. Right. I mean, the people who read the New York Times are the people who read the New York Times. Yeah, and, and, the and, Times and, but, and the Times has actually been very proactive around food issues over yeah, the past couple years. Yeah, and the Washington Post has been fantastic. Hugely but, active. But yeah. that, that, that readership is, is, um, is a static known entity. And, and, and we all know what we're doing because that's what I read. Yeah. And so uh, the, the um, social media and the new media... Mm-hmm. Are kind of where it's at, right? Yeah, you, you can find out. I mean, if you want to see how to plow a field, just go to YouTube. Right. They'll 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 show you exactly how to set it up. Yeah. And so, an awful lot of this new technology, like for example, broadcasting a show like this on Facebook, I think that that's that's really a big step. 
because that's what people are interested in. That's that's really hot stuff. That's hot media. It's not cool. It's not it's not it's not, not cable TV anymore. I feel like this is hot media. I feel like you and I are on the cutting edge of something this huge, is very Steve. Hot media. This is hot <laughs> media. We may not we may not have a lot of things that other hot media has, but man, we've got organic food and and uh, some serious political rhetoric. What about average consumers? So here's mom. She's busy. She's juggling a job, two kids, you know, so many stresses in today's world. What are some simple things? You know, it's, it's one thing for somebody to come up to OI. They take a weekend off. Ah, no stress. L.A.'s back there, that cement jungle. But if you're in L.A. or Chicago or Seattle or San Diego and you're a mom and you're trying to just kind of make your family a little healthier, what are some what are some pieces of advice that you give to people like that? Uh, eat um, fresh and frozen over canned. Okay, eat fresh and frozen over canned. Yeah, prep prepare it yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, the the movement was always a fresh movement, mm-hmm. and um, we used to grind our own grain. You wow. know, we used to grow grow our own corn. To, we still grow our own corn to grind. I mean, we we're very Luddite. We were very backward. Yes. I, intentionally backward. But you have a cell phone. I, I have a cell phone. Okay. Yes, so I have you're, a cell phone. You're part of yeah, the... Yeah, I have, I, have, I have two computers. All right. But but um, so, but so these are tools to me. Yes. And so the uh, so the, I put away the old tools mm. and adopted some new ones. And so um, that's how I grew up. I grew up eating fresh mm-hmm. in my family. Mm-hmm. My mother cooked fresh. So fresh she had and... lots of vegetables, nothing out of a can. Fresh and Unless frozen. Unless she was just too whipped to like do anything. Then, right. Fresh and yeah. frozen over a can. What other, what other eat this, not that? Any others? Less meat. Less meat. Less meat, more grain. More grain. Okay. Um, does or, that mean orga- organic but fruits does, and vegetables? But does that mean more pop tarts and less Big Macs? No whole grain. Just cook, cook oatmeal for breakfast, and mm-hmm. then have whole rice, mm-hmm. and you know, and and uh, some of these other exotic grains, maybe, or you know, or quinoa, quinoa, quinoa or, spout, or, a, or a wheat, wheat. A, mm-hmm. a wheat berry salad or something, mm-hmm. or. Um, uh, make an effort to make your own bread. In other words, try to um, to create in your own home mm-hmm. more of what you're buying. Because if you look at it's what is in the interior of the of the grocery stores, which I understand is under siege right now. Yeah, those interior that that's where the money is because yeah. it's static money. It's those shelf big, life those money. Those big aisles, those end caps, man. Those that's things, real estate. Those things are not moving like they used yeah. to. Well, the, the 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 periphery is the whole food. You know, the, the entire. I shouldn't say whole food. I should say the entire food market of the United States is stagnating. The only part that's really showing any growth is organics. So and fresh and fresh, fresh. and fresh, yeah, and so because fresh. now more fresh, mm. and like in a uh, hundred years ago, mm. which wasn't in the nineteenth century, now you remember, um, there were large production areas that were growing vegetables all throughout the United States, in the Carolinas and in Texas and parts of the South, Florida, of course, um, and also many, many hundreds of acres on the Missouri River in Iowa. All of that went away when California began to own it. Right. So we grow the majority of the nation's fruits right. and vegetables. And by the way, the shocking number that I read is less than 2% of our arable farmland in the U.S., less than 2% is planted with pulses and vegetables, meaning green stuff, yeah. right? right. Incredible. And so now, so that all went away and California owned it. And now all these new farmers... Or, or or people who are adapting, but mostly new farmers mm-hmm. are beginning to grow vegetables in those regions. Mm-hmm. They're starting to grow significantly more vegetables in terms of volume of sale in Iowa and Wisconsin and Illinois. So vegetables are coming back. Is yeah, what and you're they're saying. growing them again in That's places great. that they recognized early on that they could. Yeah, um, and in Pennsylvania, we know why. Why was the first seed company I ever dealt with in Pennsylvania? Why is the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania? Oh, it's, it's good they, soil. That was their tradition yeah. that, that they had that. Why do they call New Jersey the Garden State? Why do all the original ver- tomato varieties come out of Rutgers University? A hundred years ago, that's what was happening. And so now people have gotten a clue that 
they can at least take $2 off the cost of a box by growing it close to San Antonio, Texas, rather than depending on it from California because the shipping will kill you. Yeah, and of so course, this the, is, the, the, more, the closer you get it, the more fresh it's going to be right, in the general. shelf life. Yeah there's, yeah. There's, yeah, there's a lot of really good things. And so um, a lot of those stores are acting in the interest of their customers as well as their own self-interest mm -hmm. by trying to see if they can get more local produce. It's not just buzzy. Local means um, like, like a CSA. If people buy are in my CSA, it's almost the equivalent of having your own garden. Right. You've and just picked up a box of produce that's three hours out of the field. That's incredible. And so that's and where CSAs, a lot of these guys and CSAs are. CSAs are available in cities. Most people don't yeah. realize there are CSAs just waiting for you to become a member. It's inexpensive for the most part. Yeah. Uh, and CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And you can become a member. You don't have to be a farmer or gardener. It's a usually a monthly membership fee, and yeah. they bring a box to you, or you pick the box up, and that box is filled with whatever the farmer grew. Right. And in, so, in some of the CSAs, now you can choose, or you can get a larger box or a smaller box. Mm -hmm. You can get an add-on for some non-perishables like uh, bags of beans or something like that, too. Yeah. And uh, so the original CSA model has kind of morphed. And so uh, uh, the the ones that are that are um, servicing these large metropolitan areas are um, accumulators, or they're they're buying like I sell to a larger CSA. Okay. Yeah. They they have a a, a membership, and they're not going to grow. They're not going to buy the same thing for me every week. So they just buy whatever they buy. Yeah. And you... then then the day afterward, they pack all their boxes in Carpinteria, and then they send it to Santa Barbara and Carpinteria. Got it. So, but you're you know that is still relatively local. And I think that that is a good way to support small farms yes. because these accumulators are trying to get um, modest quantities of quality stuff, and they're not going to put something in there. They're not going to buy something, um, you know, from a distributor mm. um, that may not be may not hold up for them. So the freshness angle is always going to be important with um, a CSA. Um, I have I don't know too much about it, but um, Blue Apron mm -hmm. is another legit player. They want to buy fresh. They want to deliver fresh. They're trying to deliver a a menu, right, or a, a meal. It's a meal. A me it's, it's a, a meal, meal in a box, basically. Right. It comes to your doorstep, and, and you, then you, you assemble prepare the, it. Yeah, you yeah, it's, prepare it's, the fresh. Yeah. See, so there's that fresh, it's an interesting model, fresh idea yeah. again. Yeah, and yeah. um. Now are they in their third or fourth year or something? Yeah, they're in, they're they're moving up and they've had some, you know, they've had some serious ups and some serious downs, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, we're going to close it out, but just a couple more questions. You are here in your shirt. It's literally covered in you you came in covered in dirt. I didn't know this was going to be filmed. But my <laughs> wife said it, podcasts are always just audio, but you so we planted uh, we planted leeks yes. and and I did two of the dirtiest things. One, I spread um, soybean meal uh -huh. out on the field, which is the, my source of nitrogen. Nitrogen, yes. Certified organic soybean meal. Love it. And um, that's the source of nitrogen. It's mm. pretty hot. It's fifteen percent nitrogen by volume, so you don't use too much. And then I uh, tilled it in, mm -hmm. and it was, the ground was not as wet as I like, and it was pretty dusty. So I came in looking like you know I had just played in the dust. Yes. And um, so that's what we then we planted leeks in that, and now the water's on the leeks. So let me ask you a question: You've been doing this for a while. You've probably had a number of opportunities to do other things. What do you love about farming? Well, um, I've turned into quite a naturalist. And so when I was mowing earlier, I was mowing some old collard greens and, uh, and uh, red kale, and it was five feet high. <laughs> it was like, they, when, because we have new crop, and so I was mowing it down. Yeah. And I was mow as I was mowing, the green frogs were jumping out of the way. And so I went through... <laughs> That area, gathering up the frogs <laughs> and throwing them into this uh, other area where they wouldn't be disturbed. And then I turned around and I saw there were more frogs, and so I, 
We had to gather the frogs and put them in this area where they wouldn't be disturbed. And You're so, like the Pied Piper, uh, trying to get the mice I out of try, the field. Trying to trying to to save my frogs. Yeah. And I I feel like the frogs have been benef- beneficial to me. But these little frogs, you know, I mean, they're really, um, you know, an in, in, in endangered species. And so, um, and I provide these habitats for them. At night, you can hear them everywhere out there because I have these kind of permanent areas. Mm. And so um, I, uh, I, I write a lot about birds and frogs and toads <clears throat> and, um, and, uh, and all the various snakes that are out there. And we, we've ended up being very uh, conscientious about nature and of wildlife. And so being... Um, exposed to all of these things, well, there's a very small relationship of saying, now, that little pile of seeds there, that was probably one of these ridiculous little field mice. Uh-huh. You know, you see, you see their little habitats, or, uh-huh. or you're walking, you're you, you're driving the tractor to the end of the field, and you stop in the dust, and you look and say, oh my God, those mountain lions are back. Wow. Which is fine with me. Okay. And yeah. so that whole place at night is just a zoo. So you've got predators, you've got coyotes and bobcats, I have foxes. A whole ecosystem. And I know all these tracks. Wow. Uh, and deer. Yeah. But whenever my mountain lions are there, I don't have deer. Ah, well, <laughs> <laughs> this is how nature works. Right. Right? Yeah. And so um, that's one of the best things about it is, is um, having this, this uh, appreciation for and, um, and, uh, and a curiosity about all of the relation to all these bugs, because I'm in the business of growing nature because we have all of these um, habitat areas that are useful to me because when my, my bug guy, Ron Whitehurst gave me $270 worth of um, beneficial um, insects to, 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 protect me from um, flea beetles. I held it in my, the palm of my hand. I said, well, Ron, what am I going to do that? He says, just mix it up with some sand or something and go and pepper the area of an, of an area you're not going to till for a long time. And so I found this area, and I peppered it out. And he said, I said, is that it? He said, yeah, you, then, then you'll probably get some control. And, you know, I haven't had any flea beetles all year on 12 acres oh. from, a, from a handful of these parasites. And so as we're working out there, we see all these various helpful things that are protecting us. And so we can't use even the approved chemicals that you can use in organic farming, the approved materials, remedies, in other words, or, mm. or pesticides. Mm. So I think that's, that's probably been it, is to, is to have proven that it works. Yeah. And it sounds like you love nature and how great that you get to do this with your life and you don't have to wake up and think about what to kill. What to spray? I don't have that many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're 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 thinking about how do I save the frogs and keep the insects and the bobcat and the wildlife? You know, that's a you are a zookeeper in a way. I'm a zookeeper. Yeah. What a great job. Thank you. Yeah. That, what a that, great that, job. That, that's a good. <laughs> that's a good, good title. Yeah. So that so we've. Learned... I, I'll never catch up. Yeah. If I try to intervene. Yeah. And spray the aphids. Yeah. On the uh, on the on the mid season kale. The aphids are going to come back, and I might kill a predator that's already laying eggs in them. Mm. You know, I'd, so mm. I just walk away from it. I just plant more kale. Mm-hmm. So, okay, you guys want that? Okay, well, it's time because the kale's not defending itself anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's all about using nature to manage nature, using nature to provide nourishment. Great learning experience today. Thank you. Food is political, fresh over canned. Become a zookeeper and support zookeepers. You know, and and ladies and gentlemen, if you are traveling to our dear city of Ojai, California, stop by the farm and the cook, have a bite to eat or a salad, as Steve is growing the salad bar. And the salad bar is great. And it really speaks to one way of empowering ourselves to empower other people to make healthy, nutritious food. Steve, thank you so much thank for being you. on the show. Really great. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, I enjoy being here. It's been a good conversation. Okay, everybody, this is The Big Picture Show. Josh Tekel signing out. See you next week. We'll have Zena Musica on. She is the woman who created Zena's Gypsy Tees, and then she had a fascinating life experience, and now she is a book publisher. Thanks for tuning in. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. 
Welcome to the Big Picture Show with your host, Josh Tickell. We are the new media, so don't forget to like and share this podcast.